The Torah reading this week is Vayat Hanan, the second portion in the final book of the Torah, Sefer Dvarim. But I first want to connect an idea to what we discussed last week. Last week, we talked about heaven on earth. And the trigger for the talk was the vision and the dream that Yaakov, that Jacob had when he left his parents' home and, he's, and he, he fell asleep on the place of the sanctuary and he dreamed and he saw the ladder going up to the heavens and God with him close by and part of his experience and it awakened him to the proximity of Hashem's presence. And the theme of the class, not to go backwards here, but the theme of the class was heaven on earth. That in, in essence, when we talk about a sanctuary and we talk about a Beit HaMikdash and we talk about the Jewish people fulfilling their purpose, it's not up there, but it's down here. There's the temple. I think the way Rav Shamshin Rafal Hirsch put it, that um, he said that some sanctuaries, some churches, are meant to present you a grandeur which transports the person up to the heavens. And he said that in Judaism, we're looking for a synagogue and a tent of meeting with God that brings God down into the world in close proximity to us. So that's another way of describing this heaven on earth idea. So um, I wanted to build on that with a pretty unusual source. And, you know, I've been criticized a little bit recently that about the relevance of the topics I've talked about. So I wanted to talk about Molech, the offering of a child to an idol. Only a joking here. But there's a very strange and interesting discussion that springs up against this commandment. So we're going to start with this source, which is not in the book of Devarim, but it's back in the book of Vayikra Leviticus. It's on page 666. And 667 is the translation. It's in Parshat Kedoshim, having to do with the holiness of the Jewish people. And basically, the Torah, Hashem speaks to Moshe, and he speaks very strongly about the abhorrence of a human being offering his own child as an offering or a sacrifice to an idol. And um, we know that such worship, quote unquote, was very prevalent in the world. And I guess it's even recorded, and I didn't realize the historical verification of this, but Sancherev, who besieged Jerusalem at the time of King Chizkiyahu, and who woke up one morning to find his army decimated and who fled back to his own homeland. So there's a midrash that says that when he got back, he felt that since he had survived, he wanted to make a special offering to his idol. And he decided to offer his son, who had been with him in combat, as an offering to his idol. And the son, realizing what was going to take place, killed his father. And that was the end of Sancherev. And he ceased being the king and the ruler of Ashur that he was. Um, be that as it may, we know that Inca, Aztecs, we know other people's had this idea of human sacrifice, but it's considered very abhorrent in the Torah. Um, but let's just see the wording the Torah uses in chapter 20, sentence three. And that's what's gonna be our launching pad here for a discussion that we're gonna discuss viewpoints of Rashi and the Ramban and Nachmanides, and then a rather esoteric commentary by the Maharal. But in sentence three, it says, and I shall concentrate my attention, God says, upon that man, and I shall cut him off from among his people. For he had given from his offspring to Molech, Frank, we are, we are, we are okay? We, we given in order, to, in order to defile my sanctuary and to desecrate my holy name. So the Torah here is characterizing the sin of the um, worshiper of Molech, who chooses to offer his own child as an offering there. And, and that what the Torah is saying is what's abhorrent, what's particularly abhorrent about that person is that the person 
is is did what he did the Torah uses the word in order to defile my sanctuary and to de desecrate my holy name. So this is hard to understand and it prompts a discussion. What does it mean leman timeat mitoshi? That he was acting in order to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. Question. Rashi offers a comment which doesn't directly answer this question, but which in a way redirects our attention a little bit more broadly. And Rashi says, what does it mean to defile my sanctuary? After all, this can happen when there's no Beit HaMikdash. And also this has nothing to do with the Beit HaMikdash. The person's not offering his child to this idol in the temple. The person could be thousands of miles away. So he says, when it says that in order to defile my Mikdashai, my, my holiness, Rashi says it in fact refers to the entirety of the Jewish people, which is sanctified to God. And he makes a reference to another sentence, Velo Yichal at Mikdashai, where Mikdashai or Mikdashi in this case, my holy place can also mean my holy ones. So Rashi, in a way, is addressing this issue, not directly head on, but saying that when an individual, even when one individual Jewish person acts in this manner, they're defiling the sanctity of the entire Jewish people. And we're going to see what how this can be understood, because after all, we don't ascribe the sins of one on the many. So the Ramban takes on this sentence very, very thoroughly. And he starts by quoting Rashi. And I'm going to read, look now at the commentary of the Ramban. And in it, he's going to quote from the Talmud. And we're going to look at the Talmud quote on the screen. So the Ramban begins, Nachmanadi begins his commentary by saying the congregation of Israel, that Mikdashai doesn't refer to my sanctuary, but it refers to the whole Jewish people which is sanctified unto me, and this is what Rashi adds. And then he goes on to say, how can it be on account of one man's sin that the entire congregation of Israel, which is sanctified to God's great name, can become defiled? So he says, the sages hinted at this idea of how one person's action can defile the whole nation in the Talmud. And then he brings down this Talmud a quote. He says more than that a moment, but let's share the screen for a second. And let's read the Talmud a quote that, that Nachmanides refers to. So we're going to read it inside the Talmud. It's in Brachot 35b. Can everyone see this okay? So here's what it says. Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa said, hey, stay with us for a minute. Anyone who derives benefit from this world without a blessing it is as if he stole from God and the community of Israel. As it is stated, whoever robs his father and his mother and says it is no transgression, he is the companion of the destroyer. He is a destroyer. That's a sentence in Proverbs chapter 28, 24. So we just hang in here for a minute. The Ramban here is applying a Talmudic statement from Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa, who says that if I eat something, if I as an individual eat something without making a blessing, I'm stealing from God and I'm stealing from the community of Israel. And then he quotes a sentence in Proverbs, whoever robs his father and his mother and says it is no transgression, he is the companion of a destroyer. The, the Talmud goes on, the phrase, his father, refers to none other than God, that is stated, is he not your father who created you, who made you and established you, ascribing to God the specific sense of the creator of each of us as individuals. The phrase, his mother, refers to none other than the community of Israel, as it is stated here, my son, the discipline of your father, and do not forsake the Torah of your mother. The mention of the Torah is emanating from the mouth of the mother apparently means that your mother is the community of Israel. A sense of community being the mother, the mothering support 
that each of us as individuals have. And then we'll just read the final statement here. What is the meaning of this continuation of the verse? He is the companion of the destroyer, Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa says the same Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa says. He is a companion of Yeruvam ben Nevat, the corrupt king who corrupted Israel before their father in heaven by sinning and causing others to sin. So Yeruvam ben Nevat is a specific reference to the king who assumed the leadership of the 10 tribes one generation after the life of King Solomon. He seceded from the union of the Jewish people and he's famous for corrupting Israel by preventing his tribes, the 10 tribes that were allegiant to him from going up to Jerusalem and serving and bringing offerings in the temple because he was afraid if they did so, they would become allegiant to the king who was continuing in the, the house of David, and therefore he prevented from doing so. So he's the arch type, the arch example of a destroyer of one who corrupts others. So the Ramban quotes this whole Gemara. So a uh, rabbi, a uh, quick question. I can understand how someone who does not uh, give a blessing is stealing from God, but how is that person stealing from Israel? Okay, good, and that, that's a good question. And that your question, Frank, reflects on what the what we're trying to answer on the sentence in the Torah, where it says when someone makes an offering to Molech, that person is um, is doing so in order to defile my sanctuary, which means the Jewish people, and to profane my holy name of God. So at least you're you're lining up now the connection that the Ramban is making. Okay, so your question on the Talmud is explaining to all of us why the Nachmanides quotes this section of the Talmud, because it's also making connection between God and the community of Israel in a way that is not apparent, correct? So we're on the same page. Your question clarifies at least the symmetry, the same question we have on the statement in the Torah about the person offering his child to Molech is the same question we have on Rabbi Hanina Bar Papa. Statement connecting eating without a blessing to not only stealing from God, so to speak, but stealing from human beings as well. So here's where Nachmanides continues and I'll stop sharing the screen for a moment because um, it's not so relevant right now. So um, the Nachmanides goes on and writes the following. The purpose of creation was so that people should offer their blessings over its bounties to the great name of Hashem, assuring thereby the continuity and existence of the world. But if that is not done, God's great name raises up on high and the divine presence is removed from Israel and surely this happens all the more so when a person offers a seed to Molech and thereby such actions reflect abhorrence of the pride of Jacob, a reference to a, to a prophetic vision of Amos and God's dwelling place. So, but here embodied in this conclusion of Nachmanides, I think there's a kernel of an idea which relates so much to what we talked about last week and what the theme is of this class, which is protecting our sanctity. Because what he, what he, what he, we said last week, we quoted the Kutzker Rebbe as saying, where is God wherever we let him in? And last week we very vividly described that letting God in doesn't mean looking up to the heavens, but letting God in means sensing God's presence in proximity to me at this moment in whatever I'm doing. So if I'm studying Torah, I sense God's proximity in helping me understand ideas which will refine me and make me into a better person. If I'm drinking and I made a blessing, so then I'm defining God's proximity and offering me nourishment and feeding me so that I can continue living in the world and continue studying Torah and continue being a father and continue being a teacher and continue with all the things in my life. So this is the sense of proximity. And what Nachmanides says is, 
because otherwise God's presence returns up on high. Those are almost the words he uses and becomes removed from us. So again, this is this idea of heaven on earth, of God on earth, of Iker Shechina, the presence of God, the, the connection, the, the, the neighborliness from the word Shochen of God. It's here, it's not there. The temple experience brings God close to me by impacting every aspect of my being. The, 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 the undertaking and endeavor of Judaism is to bring God close to me. It's not to launch me into an orbit that I'm not accustomed to. And therefore, when a person in a certain sense violates this blatantly, harshly, by taking their child, which is such a gift from God and represents the sanctity of human life, and offers that child on an altar to idolatry and snuffs out that life, that person is basically saying, there's no room for God in my world. Get out of here. You, God, go back upstairs. You climb the ladder, to use Jacob's metaphor. Leave us alone. And as we'd say, you know, Hashemayim Shemayim Hashem, it's a sentence in Psalms. God reigns, lives up in the heavens and the world is ours. Leave us alone, get out of here. And in a certain sense, partaking of something from the world, also without connecting to God, is a way of denying that God has anything to do with my sustenance, God has anything to do with my well-being. You hear the extension we're making here. And it's antithetical to living in this world with a close connection to God. So to, to pull this Ramban together, to pick up a drink and to drink it without making a blessing is in a certain sense to banish God. Obviously it's not with the same incredible harshness as offering a child to Molech, but could be analogous because I'm denying God has anything to do with my sustenance, which is very important to me. It's very dear to me. It's very near to me. So I'm not just foregoing an opportunity to connect with God, but I'm actually pushing God away from my existence. And when I do so, I'm banishing God to the higher spheres. And when I do so, I'm harming the whole community of the Jewish people because I'm putting up a barrier and, and I'm pushing God, so to speak, up to the heavens. And therefore, I'm robbing all of us of this opportunity to live in this world in close proximity to God. See, so the, this is where this seemingly obtuse reference to, to someone offering their child to Molech brings us back with the Ramban's insight to our everyday life and the opportunities we have to live our lives in close proximity to Hashem. Now I wanna take a moment and again, share the screen for a minute and just look at this sentence in Proverbs, which is contained therein and just highlight that. And um, sorry, I don't remember how to highlight this thing, but what's the sentence in Proverbs? It's right here. Whoever robs his father and his mother and says it is no transgression, he is the companion of the destroyer. Now I wanna point out a nuance in the idea of robbing your father and your mother. On one hand, robbing one's father or mother could be the easiest sin to dismiss. After all, it's my father and mother. They love me, they care about me. I remember a scene from a movie and I don't remember the movie exactly, but I remember it had uh, Bart Giamatti in it where he stops at his mother's home. She's an old lady at the time. And he, he talks to her for a while and then he sneaks up to her room and he steals money that he desperately needs from her because he's too embarrassed to ask for her help. So that's a visual of what it means to steal from your father and mother. 
people who steal from their parents also have a certain thought, well, and this is all defined in the um, commentaries to Proverbs. After all, I'm going to inherit them anyway. It's just a matter of time till their money becomes my money. So I sort of have an end to it. But you see, on the flip side, and that's where the sentence of Proverbs comes in, is all these rationales and all this thought process is really the antithesis of what the Torah's value system is. Because the Torah's value system really is, who do I revere and respect? And who am I indebted to more than my father and mother? And here we can talk about your real father and mother. So if I steal from them, what a travesty. What a denial of all the good that I've received from them. What a sense of um, stabbing someone in the back. How could there be a greater example than that? And in that sense, it says he's a, that person's a companion to the destroyer. And then along comes Rabbi Hanina ben Bar Papa, and he, he, he gives an explanation. Who's your father? That's God. And he has a sentence from the Torah, because God created us. He made us and established us. And mother refers to community, because community is the petri dish of life that we inhabit. And this idea is becoming more and more remote. I've talked about that before, that we're part of a community, that if I act in a certain way, it can demoralize my community or it can supercharge my community for good. So hence you get these ideas. You see what Rebbe Hanina Bar Papa is doing is he's, he's pulling us along a channel of thought and thinking, which Nachmanides takes and relates to this sentence in the Torah in a very, very beautiful way. The channel of thought is this. It's easy when you're the recipient of tremendous love to deny and ignore the source of that. Because after all, it's a loving being. It's not gonna refer, not gonna bite me. It's not gonna harm me. You know, my mother and father, if they discover I've stolen from them, are not likely to call the police and have me arrested and press charges. So therefore, it seems like it's a safe thing to do. But on a moral level, look how demoralizing it is. Look how it's so antithetical to what a person's proper relationship to their mother and father should be. So Rav Papa takes that thinking and he applies it to blessings. Blessings of life. God provides us with so much. We're, we're, we're living in the midst, like we described last week, of a veritable garden of Eden. It has its challenges, it has its suffering, it has its pain. There's no question about all those things. But with a sense of faith, all those things become construed as opportunities to grow ever closer to God, for us to become more aware of God's connection to us, for us to live our lives on a higher plane and on a higher sphere. And I'm not dismissing anyone's pain or anyone's suffering blithely, but that's a picture of where we are. So for a person to live in the world, reach out, grab something, consume it, steal from their father, demoralize their community, act in a way which says, there is, I'm king. I decide over life of death. I own my children so I can offer them anywhere I want and I can expend them without any accountability. It's also part of what the sin of Moloch is about. So this is a godless, this is forging a godless world. Ultimately, it's banishing God. And one can see how coming off of Tisha B'Av, this is so analogous to coming to grips with the destruction of the temple and the exile of the Jewish people, and all the suffering that the Jewish people have had throughout these millennia. Now, um, I think this is a very interesting confluence of sources and ideas and thinking. But I want to add something which, which here I'm really on thin ground, and that is this. That was called to my attention that the Maharal of Prague, who um, has his very clearly unique path of understanding Judaism. He takes issue with this Ramban's explanation. 
Um, and it's not so clear to me exactly why, but one of the reasons is he looks at that Talmudic source very carefully. And he says, if eating and drinking is violating God's domain, so to speak, we have examples of this. We have holy objects that I'm not allowed to use, right? An example in our own lives, when we light the Hanukkah candles, we say we lit these candles and we have no right to utilize the light of these candles because these candles are for holiness. That's why we have a shamash. So if we do use the light, we're using the light of the shamash, not directly that light. We want this light to be pure, devoted to God, and therefore we're not even going to use it to read. Unlike Shabbos candles, please understand the difference. Shabbos candles are there for our pleasure and our benefit to bring sanctity and peace into our homes. Sanctity is related to peace. But the Hanukkah candles are different. Objects consecrated to the temple. If I take my pen and say, I hereby pledge this to the temple, and then I write with it, I'm violating a holy object and I'm, I'm infringing on God's domain. If I pledge my an animal to offer as an offering, and then I shear the wool off and I make a sweater for myself, I'm doing the same thing. So the Maral wants to offer an alternative vision, which I think fits in with the paradigm we're talking about, just on a different way. The Ramban says this, the, the Maral says this follows. Everything God created, God created ultimately to honor God. And what that means to honor God is to make, make a connection between us and God, which means that this pen, this drink, wherever it comes from, those grapes that were squeezed to make this drink, they belong to God. God is the creator. God placed it into the world. God enveloped it in the potential to attach a person to God through these physical items. So when I make a blessing and I acknowledge that, it's not that I'm getting God's permission. It's that I'm unlocking the blessing that God placed inside of everything so that it really becomes a... a, a, a source of blessing from God passing into me and having a positive impact on me and making me into a more holy being, more capable of connecting to God. Now, last week we talked about how when a person removes negative me don't like jealousy and resentment and an and overindulgence in, in physical enjoyment, especially as it violates the Torah, an unquenchable desire for kavod, for honor. Such a person is isolating themselves from God. What the Maral does is he extends that idea and says, if I drink from the world without saying, Baruch HaTo Hashem, blessed are you, God, you created this, you infused it with holiness. And as I, with you acknowledging you, bring it into my being, I'm bringing that blessing directly into me. I'm sanctifying myself. And therefore, I'm also in a positive way, not talking about just removing the negative, but in a positive way, I'm aligning myself and connecting myself to God and God's blessing. And in doing so, I'm elevating myself. I'm elevating my community. I'm, I'm, I'm making, I'm intensifying the presence of God's blessing in the world in which I live. So I think it fits in with the idea that God's main and most important presence is here in this world, but it's a more Kabbalistic, spiritual meaning. So if I pick up something and I drink it without a blessing, and I just drink it as if it's just a liquid that can be looked at in a microscope without tracing it back to the source being God and without acknowledging a sense that God has infused this with holiness so that through my appreciation and, and receiving God's kindness and acknowledging God and unifying with God, I'm actually magnifying the holiness in the world and I'm using objects and I'm drinking this drink and I'm interacting with my children in a way that affirms what God's highest intentions were, which was to make manifest God's proximity to human beings, 
That's the rum, that's the Maharal's take. It's a different nuance, it's a different emphasis. For some people, it's more inspiring than the idea that, well, at least I asked God permission, so I'm drinking with God's permission. The Maharal ratchets it up to a higher idea and say, I'm making a blessing so that the full spiritual benefit of what I'm consuming can elevate me to the ultimate extent of closeness to God. I'm interacting with my child so that my child should become an elevated human being who himself or herself will bring sanctification of God into the world. That's clearly the opposite of offering my child on an altar for a false God. And therefore, I'm intensifying God's presence in the world. And I just want to conclude by relating this to this week's Torah reading. Because very famously in this week's Torah reading, what Hanan in chapter six, and um, I didn't look up the page here. Frank is usually faster at this than I am. But we have the Shema Yisrael. It's on page 972 in the Art Scroll. It's this week's Torah reading, chapter six, sentence four, five, and six. So we say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. And it's a mitzvah to say these words in the morning and in the evening. Hear, O Israel, Hashem, our God. Hashem is the one and only. Everything that exists, myself, this drink, my child, the air we breathe, the world we live in, all emanates from God. And of course, the kicker is that with this attitude inspiring us, we go on to sentence five, and it says, you shall love Hashem, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your resources. Question, how can the Torah mandate love? Whoever heard of such a thing, you are commanded to love God. You're commanded to love. How do you command love? Love is, comes from deep within a person. So here we have these answers. In a simple level, in a direct level, Rashi and the Ramban say, by acknowledging God in our everyday lives and by making room for God step by step in our lives. So then we appreciate God. We feel God's presence. We feel close to God. And of course, we're going to love God. And the Maral adds a certain esoteric sense that by acknowledging God, hero Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one, is the, God is the source of everything, of all reality. And I bring that into myself. How can I not love God? How can I not live a life of appreciation? How can I not live a life of inspiration? And how can it, one, it follow like a lockstep? The more I acknowledge God as the only source of everything, the mitzvahs that are included in those phrases, the more I'm going to just appreciate God and the more deep my feelings are going to be to God and the more I'll be able to love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my resources, to withhold nothing back from that relationship, but to be have that feeling of closeness and devotion and love for God to be part and parcel of who I am. And then, of course, of course, I'm not going to steal. I'm not going to take my precious child and spend their person's life on something that's empty and meaningless because my life itself is going to be filled with so much devotion and meaning and love and spirit and awareness and then we start to approach the very awareness and consciousness that Jacob felt when he woke up from his sleep and said I didn't realize that this place is inhabited by God. We could wake up now, we could wake up tomorrow morning, we can wake up every day with that awareness if we follow, if we really take these ideas to heart and we embrace them and we make them part of our everyday mundane living. Everyone should have a good week. Any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Okay, everyone should have a pleasant summer evening. Thank you. Someone, are you asking a question? Because you're muted. No, 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 I'm fine.
Okay, great. Everyone should have a good evening. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. We'll see you next Thank week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.